I'll be right back. Sure. Yeah. No worries. Okay, um, so welcome everyone. Uh, right with... back. Yeah. yeah, no worries. Oops, got it. Just a second. Um, need to meet it over here. Okay. Yeah, so welcome everyone. Um, so it's already 10 and we are going to start right now. So today, uh, as a part of, so I'm Tanujay Shaha. I'm a PhD scholar uh, in the Department of Electrical Engineering in Princeton University. And uh, I'll be addressing you guys today as the Vice President of uh, Lead India Group uh, in Princeton. So Lead India is a graduate student club at Princeton University. And uh, we try to look into the different aspects of India, like political aspects, economic aspects, and even uh, Indian sports. And uh, we try to contribute to uh, the Indian perspective as overseas scholars. Uh, previously, we have done a lot of interactive seminars with uh, influential uh, policymakers. And um, um, we also have had a very fruitful um, partnerships with some of the governing and pol uh, policymaking bodies. Um, and today we are starting a new session where we are um, interacting with the really influential people of the world, the people who have actually changed the world or made it a better place. And um, with that, I'll be uh, welcoming our guest of honor today, uh, Dr. Larry Sanger. Uh, so welcome, Larry. Thank you for agreeing to do this with us. Thanks for inviting me. Yeah, this should be fun. Awesome. So uh, let me introduce uh, Dr. Larry Sanger to you guys. So uh, Dr. Larry Sanger is uh, most famously known for uh, founding or co-founding Wikipedia with Jimmy Wales uh, back in the early, uh, late 1990s and the early 2000s. Um, so today Wikipedia is an integral part of our lives and we cannot imagine an internet without Wikipedia. Uh, it's a household name today. And it's interesting to know that this name Wikipedia was actually coined by Dr. Larry Sanger right over here. Um, Dr. Larry Sanger uh, in 2001 was accredited with uh, co-founding Wikipedia by the New York Times for the first time. And um, he holds a PhD in philosophy from Ohio State University. So that's uh, surprising, you know, someone with a PhD in philosophy creating an uh, internet platform which has taken the world by storm. And um, prior to that, uh, prior to his PhD, um, Dr. Larry Sanger had uh, his bachelor's in philosophy from Reed, uh, Reed College. Uh, that's incidentally the same college from which Steve Jobs dropped out. Uh, and um, I you all, yeah, you, you finished, yeah, right. <laughs> so, and then he you know, went on to receive his master's in philosophy uh, from Ohio State University. Uh, even in college, uh, Dr. Larry Sanger uh, was a huge proponent for education and he created a platform or a listserv which would match prospective students with uh, their uh, tutors in an outside, uh, outside of or off, pla off classroom setting. And that was super popular. So in the uh, early 2000s, he created Wikipedia and uh, after a few years, he left Wikipedia and moved on to different uh, and various other projects. Uh, some of which include Citizendium, uh, Knowledge uh, Standards Foundation, and Newpedia. And all of these have been hugely successful and received a lot of media coverage. Uh, so Dr. Larry Sanger has had a really, really bright career so far. And it is also said that Larry is fascinated by traditional Irish music. So this is an information I got on Wikipedia. So we'll see if that's true or not. So with that, uh, over to you, Larry. Right. Uh, thanks. Thanks for the introduction. I appreciate that. Um, so, I, I always like talking to um, to smart people and and to geeks. They're my people. Um, and um, so, I, I want to tell you some things that probably you already know, 
I'm just giving you my perspective on them. I'm not going to make too many assumptions. Um, and uh, hopefully I'll tell you a few things you didn't know. Um, basically, I want to take you through a little bit of the history of decentralization and, um, and then explain how and why we should be decentralizing the internet today. Um, and I, I, I'm told I, I, I should like keep this to something like 15 minutes or something like that. So I'll try to keep it very short so that, that we can spend most of the time like having questions, um, which is more interesting. All right, so um, the internet used to be decentralized, right? So um, when, uh, when Wikipedia began in 2001, um, the, there were some big internet companies for sure, but um, for the most part, uh, the, the internet was still being run by protocols. Um, if, you, if you wanted to discuss things, you did so via email, via um, mailing lists, uh, which were scattered all across the world, depends on who owned the, the mail server, right? And then there was the, uh, and, and there was Usenet. These are all decentralized protocols. Um, the, uh, the, of course, web pages themselves were decentralized. And there, while there were some things like GeoCities um, and, and uh, AOL, which allowed people to have their own, their own um, presence online, and there was some push towards centralization there. That was mostly for the noobs, right? Those are, those are just for the people who, who didn't know what they were doing. Um, but a lot of the traffic, a massive amount of the traffic was still, um, uh, still decentralized. And a good indicator of that is that as, as late as something like 2005, something like a quarter or a third of, of, of all of the, the bandwidth being used online, online was the torrent network, right? So just people sharing files across the internet. That was all, uh, and, and Wikipedia, by the way, partook of that culture of decentralization entirely. Um, we were decentralized in the sense that that um, we allowed people to come together as and when they wanted from all parts of the world. Um, there wasn't any editor in chief. And all of these things were the things that are held to matter. The fact that it was just a single domain and that we didn't have an encyclopedia protocol exactly, that didn't really matter so much. I mean, it was still decentralized. That's, that's how, how we took it, and it was. I mean, we definitely partook of that culture. And then they started locking things down, big corporations and especially basically um, big investors and governments started just plowing money, losing millions, gazillions of dollars over the period of about a decade between I don't know, I, I'm just guessing 2005 to 2015. Um, by two, around 2005, a lot of these networks hadn't been conceived of. By 2015, not only were they established, they were actually starting to make money. Um, so that includes things like YouTube. A lot of that torrent network was basically taken over by YouTube. A lot of the discussion that would have taken place on Usenet, for example, that was taken over by Facebook, um, and uh, a lot of the uh, a lot of your your personal home pages. I still have one. That's my blog. Um, that, that was uh, well. That was taken over um, by by Facebook and maybe Twitter and, and Instagram. Wikipedia too has uh, partaken in this uh, culture of centralization and exclusivity. Because if you basically, it, it is, it, it was for, for many years, and it's no longer, it's interesting, um, but it was for many years a top 10 website. Um, and uh, it really made use of, of uh, the, its platform um, 
over the years, it, it has come to uh, make use of its, its platform um, to uh, advocate for single points of view, the establishment point of view. When before it was more decentralized, it practiced in a real sense, a neutral point of view. That really is no longer the case. They say they have a neutral point of view. But if you just look at the articles on political topics, you will see that those articles take a very definite point of view and on religious topics as well. Um, yes. So this is like one of the uh, major areas of questions that the students have proposed. And uh, yeah, we'd like to hear you talk more about that. Yeah, absolutely. So um, a lot of people noticed all of these problems um, about how the, the, uh, the tech giants have essentially taken control over our discourse. They've uh, started to lock things down and uh, act less as neutral carriers of communication and more as um, editorial controllers. Um, so uh, one reaction to this, uh, at least it can be construed as a reaction to it, is the, the, the whole blockchain and crypto movements. The problem is, and I, I worked as a, a CIO of, um, of Everipedia, which is a blockchain, the blockchain encyclopedia. And I support those guys still, but I, I left um, a little over a year ago now. And um, part of my concern about blockchain projects generally is they, they talk a good game about uh, decentralization, but still the people who start the coins tend to be the ones who control the coins. And so it's not really decentralized, is it? If you really want to be decentralized, we know how to do it. It doesn't require any new technology. It's actually old technology. And it's better technology too, in a lot of ways. It just needs to be made faster, which it can be, right? If you want an idea of what a modern, uh, modern decentralized technologies are, um, or at least reasonably modern, just, you know, look at HTTPS, look at email, look at the blogosphere. The blogosphere is the one I want to talk about because it, it concerns content, right? The way it works, of course, is uh, you install some free software like um, WordPress. <clears throat> it allows you to um, write in an easy, simple fashion. You don't have to know any programming. Um, and when you publish your stuff, on, on your website, along with that comes an RSS feed. So all of your posts are, uh, are formatted in a way that is according to a standard that is common. And in fact, your feeds, they can be certified as, as, um, as following the standard uh, RSS or Atom. And then of course, the, uh, the blog uh, feed readers or the news readers, um, they aggregate those um, and make them available as a single feed. You can just, you know, go through all of, of your blogs or news sources that, that uh, publish using RSS as well. So here's the idea. Why aren't we doing that with encyclopedias? And why aren't we doing that with social media? All right, that's, that's the idea that I've been trying to inject, inject into the uh, into the public con consciousness since, I guess, um, uh, early 2018. Um, this is what I talked about for most of my time at uh, Everpedia. And then um, for the last year off and on while I've been consulting, um, I've been talking about, um, I've been talking about uh, decentralizing social media. If you remember that, you probably won't remember, but last summer, um, I actually organized a social media strike and I encouraged people to sign something called uh, the Declaration of Digital Independence. Um, and shortly after that, and that, that advocated for decentralizing social media, adopting common technical standards and having multiple aggregators of social media data allowing us to own, in a real sense, our own social media presence. Um, and same goes with encyclopedias. Why should I have to go to, to Wikipedia in order to contribute to the world's knowledge? 
I my encyclopedia article on a, a, a subject should have as good a shot as anybody else's. Um, and uh, the, all of the oxygen shouldn't be sucked out of the room by, by a single encyclopedia, Wikipedia. So to that end, um, last fall, uh, I, uh, that, is, that is to say fall of 2019, I started organizing something called the Knowledge Standards Foundation. And I worked on it just using my own money for uh, several months. And then I had to take a, a long break because um, I ran out of that. Um, but uh, then um, a, a, a successful entrepreneur um, approached me and, and said, so I um, hear you, you need some help. And uh, so he, to make a long story short, he's actually um, given me more runway to work on the project. And, and so now the Knowledge Standards Foundation, which is developing something called the Encyclosphere, based on the blogosphere idea, but for encyclopedias, right? Um, the encyclosphere is going to create the global or universal um, network of encyclopedias. Yeah. I'm sorry? No, I think it was uh, someone's mic got uh, unmuted, uh, Mr. Kennedy. Oh, so. right. Okay, that's fine. Okay, so um, the, the Knowledge Standards Foundation, um, we uh, have recently incorporated just a few weeks ago We've got an excellent um, legal and bookkeeping CPA. We've got a three member board. We've got 1900 people on our mailing list. We've got hundreds and hundreds of, of uh, developer volunteers basically waiting for, for their marching orders at this point. Um, and uh, what I'm gonna do, cause I don't wanna go off half cocked as they say, um, I, uh, I've done that before. I don't like doing it anymore. I'm not gonna do it anymore. I'm gonna get this right. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna have a seminar or a masterclass, if you will. All of you are invited. I hope you will join. Um, it will be free, but uh, donations will be strongly encouraged. Um, it begins in January. So the seminar is gonna be how and why uh, to launch decentralized networks with a special focus on the encyclosphere. Um, so we're, we're going to talk tackle topics such as um, how, uh, what are internet standards? How are they settled on? What's the best way to settle them? And then things like um, how do content networks work? So what, what sort of architecture should be used? Um, what is the architecture of of the blogosphere, for example, and can that be repurposed for purposes of actually not just uh, encyclopedias, but also social media? Um, is mm -hmm. is uh, the notion of like having server-based decentralization like Mastodon, is that is that good enough? Or do we really need a robust peer-to-peer -peer sort of um, decentralization? And then, then we'll talk about very specialized questions with regard to the um, the standards of, of encyclopedia articles. Um, so like, for example, do we need a common markup for the content of encyclopedia articles or just for the metadata? I'm not sure about that one. Um, so should we use like Markdown or MediaWiki uh, uh, markup or who knows? Or maybe just HTML of some limited set, or who knows? Um, and then, um, uh, and, and various other questions, right? So we're going to go through, and not only are we going to um, have um, discussions with, with real experts, I mean, some of the best people in the world uh, uh, who, who know about these things, I'm going to be interviewing them myself. And then we're going to have a Q&A, &A, just like you're going to be doing with me here. Um, and there's gonna be regular readings. Um, I'm thinking probably not more than 50 pages per, per week. Um, and uh, there will be discussion uh, online, written probably using an old fashioned forum. Um, and uh, that will all be on encyclosphere.org. You will have to sign up somehow or other in sure, order to- um, so if, if, if that's okay, you know, if, if you can send us a link to that sometime, I will be happy to share it with all of uh, our viewers today. And I'm sure that everyone sure. will be interested. 
Well, uh, right now, this is the best way. Um, and if you if you just go to encyclosphere.org, sorry, there shouldn't be this backslash there. Um, yeah. Just go there, put your name and your address in, and you will you will get uh, announcements when when it's ready. If you want, though, you can actually help start organizing the seminar itself. We just kicked that off yesterday. The organization part of the seminar. Um, we we'll would be happy to do that. Yeah. Yeah, that that would be awesome. Um, so uh, and and um, we're organizing it via the uh, a Slack group. So you can you can check it out. We've we've got a, a dozen or so people who are, are reasonably active right now, and like I say, we've got hundreds of, of more people who have declared their interest, um, who are interested. Right. So the last thing that I'm going to uh, mention before I, I shut up is um, is this this my new book, my first and only book actually at this point, um, essays on free knowledge. So uh, the origins of Wikipedia and the new politics of knowledge. Um, Self-published because I just didn't want to deal with it, with all the trouble of going through a traditional publisher. They, they ask things of you, and I just don't have time. Um, so, um, but uh, is this available on Amazon? On Amazon, um, the ebook is on on um, uh, Gumroad and Amazon, but I'd prefer you to. Buy it from Gumroad. It's um, I get more money that way, um, but it is just the same files. Anyway, um, right and right. The the book itself. I'll just say just a tiny bit about it. It's got twelve chapters. Um, the uh, basically it gives the the history and theory of of Wikipedia. I have two chapters about neutrality. I talk about the uh, the politics of internet knowledge, um, which includes things like um, is the is is the internet changing the way that we know things collectively, um, and is it is it making us dumber? Um, and isn't that a problem? Isn't it like making us more in, anti-intellectual, really? And I think the answer is yes. Um, and then the the last part is more of uh, cont contemporary or up to date. Um, politics of knowledge. So I talk about the encyclosphere. I actually reproduce the Declaration of Digital Independence there. And then I have a long essay, which I wrote just a couple of months ago, um, about called the, F the future of, of the free internet, which is really the stuff that we've been talking about, I've been talking about now, and that I guess we will be talking about today. So. Sounds super exciting. I mean, uh, it's really exciting. And uh, I'm sure uh, a lot of us, uh, are now aware of this book and we will be uh, getting our access to this book as soon as possible. So I strongly encourage all our viewers to uh, sign up on encyclosphere.org and be a part of this wonderful initiative that Larry is taking. And also like avail of this book as soon as you can, uh, because I will be doing so. This seems really, really interesting. And it's super hot too with everything like net neutrality and uh, blockchains. So we will be getting a lot of more insight into those things uh, through his book. So awesome. So now I think uh, we can move into the question answer session. So uh, a lot of people have been actually asking Larry that um, uh, how was your journey from the beginning of Wikipedia till now? And uh, how much are you associated with Wikipedia currently? Uh, uh, what's the last part of it, the question? So, I mean, uh, a lot of people want to know what your, so how much are you associated with the current uh, Wikipedia uh, administration currently? Um, well, uh, sorry, are you asking um, how, how the, the it, uh, Wikipedia administration has changed? Or are you asking, what do I think of it now? I, I can't. So for example, like, uh, do you edit pages on Wikipedia um, or currently are like, have you like given up, you know? The, oh, I uh, see. Yeah. Uh, no, no, I, I, I don't touch Wikipedia at all anymore. I really don't care about it anymore. So I, I am, um, yeah, uh, I guess a lot of people wouldn't know this, but I, um, I washed my hands of Wikipedia entirely in early 2003. Um, so I worked on the predecessor of Wikipedia, Newpedia for a year, 
Then I worked on Wikipedia for a little over a year. Um, those are all part of the same project because the same people worked on both. Um, it's all development of the whole same movement, essentially. So I was working on that for a little over two years. And then um, they lost the ability to pay me. And um, I, I basically, I stopped working on it. And right about that same time, the, the community was being just inundated, flooded with all kinds of trolls and people who were driving away a lot of the early adopters, the earliest adopters of, of Newpedia and Wikipedia both. Um, people like professors and just decent um, people who uh, work well with others. Um, Jimmy Wells wasn't doing anything about the, these problems. And, and he uh, really wasn't interested in giving experts any sort of, of uh, special role in the system of any sort at all, even, even outside of the system, like a, a role to approve articles, um, which is something that I, that I uh, proposed and, and worked on a little bit in 2002, um, uh, later on after I left. Didn't matter. He refused to see a, a problem. And I, so I made an ultimatum and, and he, he called my bluff and I said, okay. And I've been uh, outside of uh, Wikipedia ever since, uh, just not interested. I didn't actually start criticizing it very much until 2000, late 2004 and 2005. Right about that same time, I'm sure it's just a coincidence, Jimmy Wales started saying that I'm not really the co-founder of Wikipedia. Um, but um, now it's it's funny. It's uh, everybody except Jimmy Wales seems to agree that I am, especially considering that in the first three Wikipedia press releases, I actually am identified as co-founder. Yeah, um, yeah, and Wikipedia, your Wikipedia page itself uh, agrees to that. So yeah, and and Wikipedia has really gone downhill in a lot of ways. Um, it it used to be, I mean, some, uh, there's in, in several different ways, but let's just put it this way. There is a huge moral hazard, right? Um, that's a, you know, a $10 word, um, you know, philosophers like to use sometimes. Um, meaning it's fraught with all sorts of significant ethical difficulties that it will be difficult for ordinary people to, to surmount. So um, there's a huge moral hazard, I am saying, in uh, being a top 10 web, website that is uh, run by anonymous people, okay? It's not that they are like relatively faceless executives in some boardroom in Silicon Valley. No, the people who actually run the content on the website are literally anonymous. We don't know who they are. But I mean, you can find out who a lot of them are actually if you do certain kinds of research. And there are, are people who make lists and so forth, but they have very little to no accountability. Um, and uh, I think that's a problem, right? That's yeah, that means that's it's, and it isn't just because they personally might be pushing their biases. It's because those people can very easily be corrupted. They can very easily just become agents of various giant corporations and governments, both. Um, and for that matter, criminal enterprises. Why not? Of course. You know, people who are not above spending a lot of money for propaganda. Why wouldn't they be spending that money on, on Wikipedia? That's one right. problem. And the so other I, big I, problem is, is neutrality. It's just, I, I won't go to get into it now, um, but I just want to mention that. It's that Wikipedia has, has become extremely partisan and extremely opinionated. Um, and they, they justify that in terms of the the original neutrality policy, even though they don't really follow it anymore, by saying that, okay, if we really want to be neutral, what we need to do is to be neutral among the accepted, published, credible views. 
right? And then the, the range of credible views just keeps getting narrower and narrower. So. Right. Great. Uh, thank you for the clarity on this. So uh, a lot of things were not known to us. So our next question is uh, by Jack Green from Princeton. So Jack, are you here? If you are, please uh, unmute yourself and go forward with the question. Um, if you aren't, uh, I'll be asking on your behalf. So Jack, are you here? Yeah, I'm here. Yeah. Hi, hi Dr. Sanger. My question was assuming that um, you know, during some point in your life, you've written, edited, and read Wikipedia articles. Uh, you know, it seems like perhaps that's changed now a lot, but uh, which of those activities was your favorite and why? Which of my own articles, you say? Uh, no, like whether you enjoyed writing yeah. or editing or reading well, most, perhaps at, I, at Wikipedia's peak. I see. I see. Um, Writing, editing, or reading. That's a hard one. Uh, I, I guess I, I, would, I would say reading. Um, I, uh, writing a good encyclopedia article is really hard, um, unless you are really an expert in, in something. And then it's just a pain in the, in the butt um, to, to write an article with a lot of, of, um, of sources, even if you do know a lot about the subject. Like I could write decent, usable articles in in my academic specialization of epistemology, and I've got a bunch of books over here that I could use for that um, to as as citations. But but uh, yeah, it's it's a lot of work actually. If you really want to do a good job, I, I I in those days, I guess I took I took some pride in in the work that other people were doing. Um, yeah, not so much anymore, unfortunately. Great, uh, thank you, thank Jack. You. Uh, so we have a next question um, along the same line. So it, this, this question was asked by both Soumya Aurora and uh, Diana from Princeton. So I received uh, Diana's uh, question first. So um, I'll ask Diana to please go ahead and unmute yourself and ask the question. Diana, are you there? Hi, yeah. Awesome. So. Um, I think that given the content of the talk so far, a lot of the uh, question has been like answered. So I'm just gonna like modify it a little bit and ask um, if you wanted to have Wikipedia return to the vision you had at the beginning, what changes would need to happen and is it even possible at this point to like have wikipedia become more of like the vision that you had mm -hmm. it's it's definitely not possible um the uh literally speaking the the vision that i i had well almost literally um was a, a tandem um project uh, and i i described this in 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 my book here that's over my shoulder um, it was going to be uh, a, a, a tandem, uh, Newpedia and Wikipedia working together. Um, so Wikipedia would be a content stream, which would uh, end up in the, in the laps of, of, uh, of Newpedia editors, and they would, would um, create final, or, or at least uh, stable versions of articles um, and, and publish them. Um, but uh, it, which is to say they would approve them um, and, and those would be much more credible versions. Now, I kind of gave up on that, on that vision uh, after a while, uh, especially with regard to Wikipedia itself. Um, and uh, later on in 2002, then my vision was, well, okay, at least we should have a, an approval process even if it didn't involve going through any sort of complicated procedure, we should just allow people to, to bless certain versions of articles in Wikipedia as, as being, um, as being uh, really credible. Even if that process were not run by experts and were just run by all of Wikipedia by itself, 
even that I think would be a massive change for them. They do have a, a, a sort of voting process and, and it, it seems to be okay. So they've done a little bit of what I'm talking about there, but it's still, it still uh, states the, the, uh, the, the point of view according to the rank and file contributors to Wikipedia which may not correspond to an expert view. So it really does not constitute anything like um, expert peer review. Um, and that's something that I'd, I would have liked to see for Wikipedia. And then a, a later vision that I had was, was uh, Citizendium. And in that project, which I started in 2006, 2007, um, I, um, well, uh, I asked people to, to sign a, a statement of principles, essentially a, a charter for the community. Um, so if, you're, if you disagree with it, you shouldn't be participating. That was a problem actually with Wikipedia. There were a lot of people who were, were in getting involved in Wikipedia early on who just wanted it to be radically anarchical, essentially. Um, and also they had to use their own real names. And uh, the, the third big change was there was a, an approval role for experts in the system. Um, uh, the, the problem is uh, we were launching uh, Citizendium at the same time that, that uh, Wikipedia was experience, it's experiencing its steepest growth curve. So um, there, uh, I'm not going to make any big announcements. Um, I will tell you that I have transferred ownership of the domain for Citizendium just in the last several months. Um, and uh, you should be seeing some new things from, from Citizendium. So it's possible that they will um, you know, carry on there. But again, that's not Wikipedia. The problem with expecting Wikipedia to make big changes is that self-selecting internet communities tend to be, I think this is fair to say, this is just a hypothesis of mine, but so far I don't, I haven't found any counter examples. Um, Self-selecting internet communities tend to be very internally conservative, which is to say they sort of settle on their, on their uh, policies relatively early on in the early days. And then it doesn't change much because basically the people who don't like those basic policies they leave or are pushed out um, or they, they are repelled when they come later and they don't like it. Um, there has to be like a, a massive, um, uh, I don't know, a, a, a revolution within, a, a, within the, the community. And well, that's not gonna happen. Um, instead of uh, revolting, what people do online is they create alternative projects. So I could see there being some sort of revolution in, in uh, Wikipedia to, to make it better, but I've never heard of such a thing happening. Maybe some of you, some of you, um, you know, internet history, history geeks can, can inform me about this, but I've never heard of such a thing as a, uh, as a, a revolution that changed, fundamentally changed the nature of a project from the grassroots. You see what I'm saying? So. Awesome, awesome. Thank you, Diana, for the question. And thank you, Larry, for this detailed answer. Um, now let's move on to uh, a question from Sriram Compella. So he's from Politecnico di Milano, Italy. So Sriram, if you're there, can you please uh, unmute yourself and ask your question? Hi, how are you? Hi. Uh, so my question is uh, regarding the internet by information biases that you've already mentioned. Um, the internet that we have right now. What? Sorry. The it's it's regarding the information biases that you've mentioned on the internet. Right. What about it? Uh, so uh, what we right now are seeing is whatever in, in, on the internet, whatever you search, for example, the advertisements or anything, they are trying to bolster the biases that you already have, right? Or, well, that's what I think. Yeah, so uh, I mean, uh, this, this sounds like a very terrible thing that is going to happen. 
so this is causing extreme polarization so how do you think that we should tackle this in as a society yeah um it's a good question um i think a large part of what is causing the polarization is um well there's two different there's two different causes one is that internet communities tend to be self-selecting okay so it's just sort of a sociological fact of life that uh, birds of a feather flock together and the internet makes it easy so um conservatives go with conservatives and left-wingers go with left-wingers and and you know never the twain shall meet i guess uh, online anyway um and uh and it, it certainly looks like, looks that way that sort of behavior um to a certain extent at least a case can be made that that's actually amplified by by certain um encouraged behaviors on on facebook especially but for what it's worth i don't know if i really buy that but there's another thing that that makes uh, for this sort of of um uh this sort of polarization in my opinion i'm not an expert on this uh, so i'm just uh, i'm just sort of uh, giving you what i think as a as a layman on on these topics um but uh, I, I think a lot of people are taking their cues from the, the their media leaders. I think Wikipedia itself has taken its cues about how to interpret its own neutrality policy from from its media leaders. So that when when um, the mainstream media started becoming extremely noticeably. I'm just talking about the United States. I have no idea how it is in India. I'd, I'd be curious to know if it were similar in India or, or other parts of the world for that matter. Um, but in the United States, for sure, as, uh, as I'm sure you all know, um, basically in the last 10 years, it's gotten, it's gotten uh, so that uh, I, over half of the actual media uh, broadcasts and writing that is done is and especially since Trump became president, um, it's it's become very polarized. Okay, and people are are reacting to that to a great extent. And there aren't very many channels, literally and figuratively, um, where uh, left and right, Christian and Hindu, etc., are all talking in as part of uh as, as uh, equal members of the same net network basically so i actually think and maybe i'm just i could be entirely wrong about this i hope i'm not but i i think there is some reason to think that decentralized networks like the blogosphere and like the encyclosphere would be will actually help with this problem a little bit so what I, what i want to see exist and i i talk about this a little bit in again in the essay about the encyclosphere in the book and in other stuff if you get if you go to encyclosphere.org and and um you just follow the links to the blog there's a right now there's a site password um but you just you just go to the blog and you you will see that um uh, a lot of a lot of this is sort of laid out there um what what needs to exist is a rating system for all the encyclopedia articles. Um, I should be able to go and in the same way that I could publish my own encyclopedia article and then have it uh, appear alongside the others um, because it had been published according to, uh, um, I don't know, encyclosphere simple syndication <laughs> um, protocol. Uh, because it had been published in that way, in the same way, I should be able to also publish my ratings of other articles. And um, if this if this were the case, if I could publish ratings of content, because this could be applied to other kinds of content, but let's just start with encyclopedia articles. If I could, um, if I could publish my ratings of encyclopedia articles 
and I and they were I knew that those ratings were entirely under my control. They were out there forever attached to a particular article or a particular version of a particular article. Um, and uh, there wasn't anyone who was going to mess it up. And it was also according to a relatively stable standard that was I knew, or at least believed, would continue to be used for a long time. Then actually, I and other people who think like me, we I, I might actually start taking the time. It's difficult to sit down and do a proper job of, of rating an encyclopedia article, right? You actually have to read. Actually, if you really want to do a good job, you have to read it from the beginning to end, not just like extract a few facts from it. You actually have to read it from the beginning to end, which is not easy because encyclopedia articles tend to be kind of boring. Um, and then, um, then the idea is that you know you might be able to rate it on on various scales and so forth. Now here's the interesting thing: in order for this network to exist, there actually has to be a an identity system, a cell phone identity system, right? So I have to be able to control um, my own uh, identity. I have to be able to prove to others that that um, my articles are in fact written by me, that my ratings are in fact my ratings and not somebody else's and so forth. And in order to have a, a, a real credible rating system, we have to be able, we have to have a one person, one vote system. That means we have to really be able to nail down the problem of identity online. Well, a lot of people are working on the problem of identity right now. So we, uh, the Encyclosphere is probably going to make use of the W3C's um, uh, DID protocol, um, the, the distributed identity protocol. And um, we actually made some contributions to that. Um, so excited about that. And then just imagine as a, a little addition that we have to that information that, that people can share uh, about their ratings and also about themselves. So then they can say, um, okay, so um, I'm with this party, I'm from this country, I'm, I have this gender, I have this religion, um, I have these academic credentials, um, I work in this industry, et cetera. Then if there are enough ratings according to this, then people can actually start um, slicing and dicing the data, the ratings data, it actually becomes interesting. And we, we no longer have to, to rely on these easily um, gameable algorithms, which in my opinion, can be used for all sorts of nefarious purposes. So what's my point? My point is when this sort of like um, rating system is possible and we can act, just imagine if we could actually come up with the, the top rated article about God, according to Hindus, and then the top rated article according to Christians or according to Protestants or whatever, and according to atheists and, and so forth. It would be really fascinating to see how, what the top rated article on not just that, but all kinds of political topics would be like. Um, I, I think the effect, I've thought about this, right? And I think the effect of having a sort of competition to write the best article from each significantly different point of view, um, the, if, if we could arrange to make it happen, and that's a big thing to ask, but I think it's possible. If we can arrange to make it happen, then, then I mean, it will, well, let's put it this way. If I were to read the article about God written from a Hindu point of view, even though I'm not, I'm not a Hindu, and if we're the top rated according to Hindus, I have no doubt that I would learn a lot and I would gain a great deal of respect for the Hindu position on that topic, right? But just think about any unpopular political view you have right now, right? So there's a bunch of people who are really mad at you for holding that belief, right? Um, then imagine you had at your disposal an article that is the top rated article according to you as a Democrat or as a Republican or as a whatever, right? Um, 
And uh, so according to, to you, it's the, uh, according to people like you, it's the top rated. And then you show that article to other people. This is not like something from Fox News or MSNBC. This is not a piece of fluff. This is the, the best written, best sourced article on the topic, according to um, people who agree with a certain point of view. That, that will actually sort of lift the, the, the scales from people's eyes about the sophistication that everybody else has in holding their points of view. And this is actually one of the problems. We, when there is a great deal of um, polarization in society, the effect of that is we think other people are idiots. And the problem is they're not. Um, and of course, some of them are. Uh, and, and certainly they, they uh, you know, political warfare certainly can, people, can make people act like idiots for sure. Um, but with, with this available, then, wow, it'd be really interesting, right? Just imagine, imagine the top rated article um, that, uh, you know, on, on the 2020 pre US presidential election, you know, according to uh, Trump followers and according to Biden uh, voters, right? That, that'd be interesting, wouldn't it? That would be enlightening. So, right. and I think it would it would ultimately redound to um, the the benefit of all. I hope so, but I also bear in mind uh, familiar familiarity breeds contempt. <laughs> this is another basic principle about why we, people might be at each other's throats online. Um, basically, before um, we weren't we didn't live so close to each other in our mind space. Like we're right next to each other. I, I mean, I can talk to people from India, which is literally on the other, other side of the world. Um, and like, and like have a, a discussion with such a person just as if I, just almost as easily as I could with, with somebody in the next house next door, right? And if it's true that familiar, familiarity breeds contempt, the more we actually learn about each other, maybe the more we're going to start acting like warring siblings, um, like, you know, who just can't get along. That's my worry, actually. But I actually think that greater information is going to ultimately lead to more peace. At least I hope so. Thank you, Larry, for this uh, detailed answer. That actually answered a lot of questions uh, in one question. Uh, so moving on, the next question I think is from uh, Tushar Sharma. He's uh, currently working at uh, NXP Semiconductors in Arizona. So Tushar, if you're there, could you please unmute yourself and ask your question? Yeah. Hi, Larry. Uh, thanks for uh, giving us time today. Uh, so my question is uh, uh, in regard to what you mentioned here. Um, so uh, most of the content right now, um, the root of the content, I will say, is somewhere or other tied to academia because a lot of people in academia do a lot of writings and, you know, we use that as a basis of doing other writings and so on and so on. Now, when you talk about these bias, you know, do I'm you sorry, believe... When you say, I'm sorry, when you say rankings, what, what rankings are you referring to? Not rankings, writings, uh, just the content which is getting generated in academia, whether it is journals, whether it is, you know, publications. And now also there is a push of uh, open access policy in academia for different journals. So the, my, my question still, uh, one thing which I don't understand is, given uh, your vision about, you know, uh, uh, you know, reducing this polarization and gap, do you think that most of our academic content is also biased in nature? And because of that, uh, the popular opinion which gets uh, circulated over social media or over Wikipedia automatically gets biased. So how does it guarantee that uh, your idea which you want to pursue will not be biased given the fact the sources will always be biased because the roots are still with the academic people? Yeah. Um, right. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a good question and it's, um, it's hard. Uh, first of all, 
um, academia is allowed to be biased, um, and and uh, it, it should be. Uh, it's I mean, people should take a, a point of view. They should defend it fairly. Now, there's a difference between having a point of view and and uh, defending it, it in a, in a way that is like intellectually dishonest. So there's there's uh, academic standards. Um, that that ought to be upheld, which are sort of uh, nonpartisan. They're they're uh, they're ortho orthogonal, or they ought to be, to uh, partisan politics, and uh, standard things like standards of evidence, and um, and uh, going to the trouble of of defending um, views that are shared by like-minded people, but which are rejected by significant minorities, that kind of thing. Okay. Um, I think in that sense, uh, in my experience anyway, and I, I mean, I, who am I? I, I, I don't, uh, I don't, I haven't familiar, familiarized myself with a, even a, a, a decent sampling of all the different academic writing in the last 10 years from all the different fields online. But from what I understand um, from various essays I've seen over the past decade or so, yeah, I mean, the, the quality of academic writing, and I, this does seem to apply to some extent to, uh, to philosophy, just isn't as good as it used to be. Back in like the 1950s and the 1960s, things seemed to be more tightly argued there and and um, clearer. Um, that's just talking about philosophy. Um, and now there's this tendency to, and I think it's just the, the sheer flood of people getting into academia knowing that it's publish or perish. Um, and, and uh, you know, it's that the signal of noise, the signal to noise ratio is gonna is gonna go down a lot if you get a lot more people making noise in academia. So there's to a certain extent, I think that is is part of the problem. Just simply having a lot more people publishing, um, maybe before they should, just because they want a job or whatever. Um, frankly, and. I don't mean to boast or anything, but that actually is one of the main reasons why I have never published very much myself. It's like I felt like okay, I didn't have that much to say, and, and it probably wouldn't wouldn't hold up against um, you know stand stand up in, in, in sort of competition with the stuff that I really admired um, from you know reading from the earlier parts of the twentieth century. So it's just like. I, I hated the publisher parish system, which is one of the reasons why I, I didn't get into it. So I think that has a lot to do with it. Again, it doesn't have to do with politics. Okay, but then we need to talk about the pol political side of things. Um, I, academia has become much, much more left. Sorry, folks, for telling you the truth, but it is the truth. Um, and that matters. Um, and uh, especially, especially in um, like, humanities and social sciences. Um, there where it really matters what presuppositions you make um, as more and more things become verboten, more and more things become required doctrine. Um, the, uh, the more and more simplistic um, and, and uh, lazy the writing is bound to become, and if you if you uh, think that isn't a, a generally applicable principle, then I, I would say, um, just as an example, look at the the writings of people who who work at at Catholic universities and Bible colleges and things like that who might be doing good work when they're writing about Christian theology, but look at what they, when they write about other subjects outside of their, their, uh, their fields, when they, when they write about those other things, they sort of carry their own sort of dogmatic spirit with them. 
I think that is happening to the left in academia today. So does that have an effect on, on um, uh, the, the bias that we can see in Wikipedia? Yeah, Wikipedia is a, it's a, it's a snapshot of what the, the establishment point of view is, especially the establishment scientific and, and uh, academic point of view. Um, and uh, that's only made worse by the fact that there are uh, a lot of sources uh, are, are conservative sources are systematically excluded. And also, and this is something that is less known, um, um, primary sources are discouraged. They aren't, they're not forbidden by any means, but they're discouraged. They actually want you to use secondary sources in Wikipedia. Um, because, and that the reason for this is it's not, not far to seek. It's because um, primary sources um, need some, generally need some sort of interpretation. And they can also, like uh, the, the author of a primary source or his students or whatever, um, can, can um, come to the Wikipedia page and like push it as a source. Whereas secondary sources, they tend to summarize a lot of information in a way that is supposed to be regarded as more, you know, credible, I guess. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of different things that are militating right now to make, you know, what ought to be a, a broad, open, neutral representation of lots of different points of view on Wikipedia, it's, but it's turning it into sort of a monocultural establishment um, organ of propaganda. It's what it's more and more coming across as. So just my opinion. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Larry. Yeah, that's really, um, really great to hear. And uh, we learned a lot about the secondary sources and we preferred more. I didn't know about it. So in that academic sphere, I know that we aren't allowed to cite Wikipedia articles in our references because they aren't authentic. Uh, many of the, our viewers might not know that, but uh, you know what Larry is saying, I totally agree with it. So we're almost at the end of our session. So we would like to close with... Uh, uh, Prakriti's question. So Prakriti is uh, currently a PhD student um, at Princeton in uh, QCB. It stands for Quantitative Computational Biology. So Prakriti, if you're here, uh, can you please unmute yourself and ask your question? All right. Hi, everyone. Um, firstly, Larry, it is really cool to be interacting with you. Um, and secondly, uh, my question is, so given how other um, encycle sources are open Kind of open source ideas of bringing in other people's opinions have not really panned out well in um, in the past. What gave you confidence that Wikipedia would succeed? And kind of related to what you just said, um, in Wikipedia's success, how do you think that um, it can stop being monocultural? So, are you are you asking why did I think it would succeed back in like two thousand and one? Yes. I see. Um, well, first of all, uh, it was basically the second big open content project period online. Um, so if you think it, it, it basically the, the, the question sort of presupposes that we that I would have had background knowledge about the track record of, of open content. Um, uh, back back then, before before the, the track record had been created yet, um, and I mean, you are right that a lot of <clears throat> a lot of wikis, a lot of open content projects, just never really quite worked out. Um, and it is a very unique blend of of features that made Wikipedia work. Um, and I had to tell people, I did a, quite a bit of consulting about um, a, 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 quite a few academic <coughs> wikis and 
other uh, academic publishing projects, but innovative ones that that tried to make use of some sort of collaboration. Um, and I had to tell them over and over that there are certain things you're just doing wrong. Your plan is not it's not going to work out. And the, the problem was always, you know, they couldn't get enough people involved. Right. Um, and people were not they they didn't they thought that all they had to do was make use of the of the tools and then the, the Wiki, wikipedia magic would just take over but it didn't work that way the reason that wikipedia worked was it was radically open anybody could participate and that means anybody and um you didn't even have to have an account which again, probably, especially early in the early days made a big difference. Um, so the thing is, um, Wikipedia itself worked really well for what it was for the first like five years. It was, it was on its way. All they had to do is fix some problems with the, with the system. This is what I, kept telling them basically um, and they wouldn't listen. So, I mean, I kind of agree with you but not because of the track record of Wikipedia but because I could see, I was, the, I, I designed the thing. I knew what the design problems were, or what design problems were emerging. Um, but it wasn't, again, it wasn't because of the track record actually based on the track record, we expected it to succeed. Um, because the track record, record that we looked at was that of uh, open source. And open source is a tremendous success, as far as I'm concerned. I, I mean, you might disagree, but um, I mean, it, it hasn't been as successful, like Linux is, isn't as successful as Windows or even Mac in terms of like dollar value or anything. On the other hand, I don't know. I mean, look at how much Linux actually runs of the world's stuff. And have you have you installed Linux lately? Have you installed like Ubuntu or anything? I I, I run it. It's my daily driver. I like I uh, my first experience with Linux um, was uh, Red Hat Linux back in like 2002, and um, then it was it was kind of painful. I was surprised even back then that it worked as well as it did, given that it was free. But yeah, it was really only for geeks. You really had to know the command line pretty well, and and so forth. That is no longer the case. Actually, um, you don't really have to know the command line except for a few things, and then you know. So grandma and grandpa, they actually can use Ubuntu. And there are cases of, of uh, geeks just installing Ubuntu on their parents' laptops and saying, just don't touch anything. Just here, click on these icons. They work just like you're used to. And they do. It's like just as good. All of the, the UX is pretty much the same. Um, and uh, it won't really be that different for, for um, you know, mom and pop. So um, anyway, I'm, I'm getting off the, the subject. I think, hope that answers your question. Yeah, thanks so much. And um, how do you how, how are you going to prevent a Wikipedia from becoming the monoculture um, reflection that you were talking about? Well, you know that I'm I'm not with Wikipedia anymore. Do you, do you mean the Encyclosphere, perhaps? Um, yeah. Okay. Um, well, first of all, the Encyclosphere is not going to be a um, is not going to be a, a project or a platform. It's uh, it's genuinely going to be a network. Um, if it's not a network, I will have failed. Um, so it, it's uh, we're trying to inspire people to develop different apps. So, like, I would be overjoyed if, like, a few of you, for example, were to develop some, some um, aggregators and some apps and some like media wiki and WordPress plugins that would output uh, encyclopedic content according to standards, for example. Um, 
So there's a lot of different things that could be done because there's a lot of different moving parts when you're when you're creating an, a network. And actually trying to deliberately create all the pieces of a network is kind of it's kind of um, back ass word, really. It's it's not um, it's not usually how it's done, but I, I hope we will be able to to get it done that way. But if it if it works, of course there's going to be a lot of different um, uh, uh, cultures for the very simple reason that, um, well, I mean, it's just going to unify a lot among other things the the encyclopedias that are already be, that are already there. So Wikipedia itself will be on the encyclosphere, but so will Britannica and Ballotpedia and Wolfram Alpha and uh, in Everipedia and so forth all of which we've talked to, by the way. Um, and there are, let's just say, I'm not gonna talk about in specifics, but there's a lot of support for it. And so it looks like if we actually come up with the standards, they're gonna be put into use. Great, uh, thank you. Uh, I think uh, this in this session, we actually covered uh, the past, present, and actually the future of online content, uh, which was the topic of uh, today's session. And uh, it was really helpful and we learned a lot of stuff uh, about uh, Wikipedia, then moving on to other things like uh, Encyclosphere and Everypedia and about your book, which I encourage everyone to get a copy of. And uh, yeah, so thank I want to end this session by thanking Larry once again for agreeing to do this with us. It was really informative and uh, we're really grateful that he agreed to do with us. All right, thank you. Thanks, uh, everyone. It was it was fun, and you're very welcome um, to to join us on uh, everpedia.org. It, it actually is an, an Indian uh, fellow who runs his own uh, dev shop um, in uh, I think it's Delhi, actually, um, in uh, who who is um, uh, doing the design for our our new site, which should be coming out next week. Awesome. I encourage everyone to. Uh... Uh, check that out, everypedia.org, right, Larry? Yep. Awesome. So check that out. And uh, thank you, everyone, for joining. Thank you for registering and uh, like with you putting forward your wonderful questions. I also see there is some debate uh, going on in the chat section. It's really encouraging to see the interest of everyone. And uh, yeah, we'll see you in our next seminar series. And thank you once again. And Larry has sent the link once again. It's encyclosphere.org in the chat. So please uh, feel free to check that out. So with that, I'll be signing off. See you guys later. Bye. Good. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.